Hello and welcome to my channel Haley Marie Vintage. Today we have a sewing project since I am in my sewing project corner. So we're going to start with a pattern but this is a dress I've been so excited to make. I have been dying to make it. It is going to be for my friend's wedding. My two best friends are getting married and it's my first ever queer wedding so I'm really excited. So what I'm going to make is this evening dress here. I'm going to make the long version but I'm not going to make it with the uh, like it has tool in it. I I want the holographic fabric to do its thing. I was originally gonna go with the 1980s gunny sacks pattern I picked up, but then I saw this pattern and it just kind of reminded me of a tuxedo and I thought that would be more fun to wear for a queer wedding. No description, this looks like it has four panels, so I guess eight. Or maybe six because it's probably on the fold except for of course as always i will be doing the back with the zipper oh good spooky's gonna say hello are you irked about these flowers being in your way let me get out of her way so she can shine yeah okay but yeah i'm really excited about this i will not be doing there's a bolero with this pattern and i don't like boleros so i will not be putting my time into a bolero but that is the pattern and then here is the fabric i always hope this shows on camera as cool as it is in real life it's this beautiful holographic lavender fabric here do you want need me to push this back so you can go around it come here spooky okay or don't i also have a matching can i have this Thank you, Spooky. And I also have, this will be my lining fabric. I'm so excited about this fabric. I have been dying to use it. You good? Are you done being noisy? You say hello. Go jump and do your thing. And I have no idea how this will be to work with. It is not very slick, so I think it'll be okay. Oh, look at that. I think it looks really cool in the camera right now, but maybe I'll go back and edit this and be like, no, it doesn't. But I'm so excited. And I chose it in the lavender color because lavender is a very traditional like queer color. And then the holographic gives it the rainbow and the tux gives it some like queer energy, uh, some gender bending, like the tux shape on the front of the dress. So I'm really excited. This will also include some featherweight boning. So I'm gonna give my first go at that. I'm pretty excited. And I'm gonna, I think, try to find a petticoat at Goodwill before the day. I am making this like well over a month in advance. So I should be able to find something, fingers crossed. Oh yeah, this project I have a lot of time to work on. I gave my Myself plenty of time. I have five full days. I have two weekends and then one of those weekends is a three-day weekend to work on this project. So that way I can really take my time and make it perfect because I have to do this fabric justice. Even though I could definitely get more if I wanted it. I want to do this right the first time. I feel confident enough in my fitting ability that I'm not going to make a mock-up for this guy. If anything with this dress, I predict needing to take it in a little bit more around the waist, which will be super easy to do. I want to be able to dance, which means this has to not move. So we'll see if the boning's enough. Enough, and then if not, I'll show you how I reverse engineer it, sticking some straps in this guy. Now we are actually gonna hop in and kick off with me cutting this fabric. All right, first I'm starting out by cutting out the lining. Usually I cut the lining out second, but because this is just cutting out these four pieces, it's not too bad, so I went ahead and started with it. Usually I like to do my slippery fabrics after I've had some victory with other fabrics, but today I thought it would be all right. And then here I am cutting out the big fabric pieces, the whole thing on the holographic fabric. It's so pretty, I love it so much. And cutting this was pretty straightforward. It's fairly firm or stiff, so I didn't feel like it was shifting a ton. And again, I think it's such beautiful fabric. These pieces were ginormous though, so that was a little bit of a thing, but we all kept working and I just kept cutting. And here, as always, is your reminder that I have a Kofi. if you wanna go over and buy me a coffee. I put a ton of time and dedication into this channel, so I always appreciate it. But back to the project. In retrospect, which, spoiler alert, I guess it turned out all okay, I should have probably tested if this was a fabric with a nap. It was not a fabric with a nap, but I was thinking about it while I was sewing and all of a sudden started to worry about it, but it all ended up okay and it did not have a nap, but I definitely should have maybe done my due diligence a little bit better. As always, I'm beginning by marking out my darts. I chose a white chalk pencil this time because it was really hard to see anything on the holograph that wasn't like this white. I am marking on the inside, so it's not something I have to worry about figuring out how to wash out or get rid of. And I am just following all the markings that I put down. After this, I am then pinning these darts 
This material was a little tricky to pin because you had to make sure you like got a clean poke through it or it might kind of snag the material. So that was interesting. And this time I did actually do some test stitching on a different material. Here I'm doing a real dart, but I did test beforehand. So the main problem that this potentially has is the needle will snag the iridescent threads and kind of poke them down and under. And then those are super catchy and annoying. So that is, I guess, a note for this fabric if you ever happen to come across it. It is not dissimilar for the fabric I used for my pride dress. Otherwise, making the darts was really straightforward. And here I am tying off all my dart ends. This is my preferred dart finish. And now I am ironing it. I was very, very careful with my iron settings on this because again, I didn't quite know how it would iron. It irons best a little bit below the wool slash silk setting, any hotter and it starts to stick and you can tell that the material isn't working with it. With any synthetic mystery material you work with, always just start low and go higher. Obviously the higher you can go, the crisper of seams you can get, but you don't want to do it at the price of burning your fabric. All things considered, I thought this pressed okay. Now I get to start on my main seams. Here I am seaming the main back seam, which already has a finished edge, which is a bonus. This will be where the zipper goes in. And I'm ironing those seams before pinning more things to this, like the front pieces, the side pieces. Uh, so this consists of two back pieces, two side back pieces, two side front pieces, and a front piece. So I'm first getting the back and the front assembled separately. Here I am pinning those side front panels to the front. If you listen closely, you'll probably hear cat purrs during this time. Spooky has decided to snuggle close during my voiceover. But here I am sewing those seams together. Nothing too complicated here. It's very straightforward. And of course, I'm continuing to press those seams open. It is absolutely important to press your seams, especially weird materials like this that you're probably not going to be pressing in the future. So it's a good thing to do it now. I like to do these types of like kind of curvier seams over a pressing ham to make sure everything is fully like filled and I'm not worried about like any weird indents. Your body is more curved than flat. So getting a like nice big pressing ham can be really helpful for this. And here I'm finally putting those side seams of the back and the front together. Spooky is a close observer. She is very needy, as we all know, but I do enjoy having her as my little companion while I sew. Here, I'm going a little slightly rogan off on the instructions. Because this is strapless, I want it to have plenty of support, so I went ahead and interfaced the lining. I'm just using a medium sheer weight interfacing to do this, but I just, I felt like it would be better to have more structure than not enough structure. So I am doing that here and just ironing these on. And after ironing those, I'm just cutting off the little bits of extra I have kind of poking around. This is just so the glue doesn't later get on my iron when I start pressing seams. And then it is time for me to pin all my bodice pieces together. Again, this is as straightforward as the outside shell that I just finished. And it is important to note that I am pressing these only from the top because of that interfacing I put on it. If I was to press it from the other side, I would likely get glue on my iron. And here instead, I can make sure the seams kind of fuse because of the glue. I did do a little bit of a burn on the front, which you might catch glimpses of as the project goes on. But luckily, this is the lining, so it's no big deal. And again, none of this is in the instructions. I mean, I think they assume you have a level hem, but I was leveling out the hem anyway. And then once that hem was all leveled, I am just folding it over once to give myself a clean seam on the inside of the garment. So I did a fitting this morning and I did have to take in about a half inch a couple of places around the bust to make this fit a little bit better. So here I am moving those markings also onto the lining. I shouldn't have made the lining until I was done with this, but that's okay. I got it to all work out. It was just right in the waist, but it was a little loose at the bust. So I'm just bringing those in. Luckily, this dress has like eight seams for me to bring in that like extra on. So it was pretty easy. The most challenging part was doing it exactly the same on both the lining and the dress, which is what I am doing here with all my mark transferring. What you see me doing here is following that new line that I drew from the alterations where I'll then match it to the end and then I'll unpick the seam that I already put in because that will help basically make everything iron flat and not look lumpy and bumpy. 
And with the lining altered to match the bodice alterations I made, we are now ready to attach the two. So I am running this down along the zipper and then up over every single edge. I did have to trim some lining in certain places because I did change the shape a little bit from what I was doing, but it all basically works out. And I stitched these together really carefully. I'm trying to make sure nothing is slipping or doing anything too wild. And with that, it is time to clip all my corners and curves and turn the bodice inside out. I chose not to understitch because the instructions didn't tell me to, and I felt the interfacing would be enough. And most of where I actually would have wanted that understitching was around the curves, and I didn't quite think I could pull that off. So instead, I'm very carefully poking out those curves and then pressing them and I'm rolling them back and forth to try to get that perfect edge uh, where you can kind of basically see the stitching. This is just important for them to stay looking symmetrical and curves sometimes just take a little bit of fiddling with to get to look the way they should. After this, it's easy enough to put the zipper in. As always, I do my usual method where I don't pin it and I just go down and around doing a lapped zip so it'll be thin on one side and larger on the other. This is the closest to matching zip I have, which is not shocking. Periwinkle was not a particularly common color. I feel like in vintage metal zips are usually more of a lavender or a blue. And now I'm adding my label. My favorite thing when I add my label is to give you a view where you can't tell all what's happening, but I'm just zigzagging this to the lining so it will only be stitched to the lining and not to the outside of the dress. And because of my alterations, the bodice doesn't perfectly fit the lining, so I am adding in tacks that are more similar to what you would see in a coat. They do tell you to tack this down, and I am tacking it down by using these like kind of knot stitches to give it a little bit of wiggle room because things aren't exactly matching, but I need to make sure these go through the seams because it is best that they do that so they are not visible on the final dress. So I'm just giving them the wiggle rooms of about a half an inch to three quarters of an inch of like a tacking stitch essentially. Hello and good morning. Spooky says good morning too. So today I am continuing my work on this project. I haven't done a check-in for a while. I have worked on it multiple days at this point. Figured I'd do a check-in on where we're at. Here we have the dress. It's pretty close to done. So all I have left with this dress is putting in the boning, putting in a hook and eye, and then hemming it. I'm probably gonna need a friend to come over and help me hem it. So that's gonna get done when it gets done. And I also didn't wanna hem it till I had the petticoat done. This is something I haven't mentioned to you guys yet, but I've decided to use style 2253 there's this very poofy petticoat i've decided to use this to make a petticoat for this dress i really like this dress so far but i feel like it could use something to like volumize out the bottom so i'm gonna make this petticoat here i didn't want to hem my dress until i had this done i did pick up my materials i got six and a half yards tool from joanne and then i recently went to a fabric sale where i picked up however much of this there is <laughs> i decided to make this in white because it would be more versatile for other things but yeah, I'm gonna get started on this. I am gonna make some alterations. There's kind of like a pencil skirt like these under it. And since I plan to dress dance in this, I don't want any sort of pencil skirt. So while I will use the yoke shape, I am going to similarly gather it and make it flounce out on the other things, if that makes sense. So that is my plan here today. My plan before lunch, I would like to get my hand sewing prepped for the dress so that's the boning and I have a hook and eye I need to put in and then I want to cut out this fabric so that's my goal before lunch and then after lunch we're just gonna see how far I can get I have a friend coming over sometime between three and four you'll probably see me change outfits at some point because uh, I didn't feel like getting dressed for this check-in but I am eventually going to a nicer Italian place and will need to not look like a slob so we are gonna go ahead and jump into it and get started everything has been going really smoothly on this project I don't anticipate that changing so I'm pretty excited honestly this was a really simple dress the last thing I also have to do besides deciding on the length I need to decide if I want to do the buttons down the front I was thinking it would give it a more tuxedo look but I kind of like how it looks without it so I'm gonna get my friends whose wedding this is for opinion on that and then we're gonna go from there let's go ahead and hop into me working on everything so with my 
I guess impulsive decision to make a petticoat. I now have another hole cutting out scene. This is a taffeta I got really cheap at a fabric sale. It's going to be a little tight to make this work, but I decided to do so. I do want to note while cutting, I have completely altered the way this pattern works. So under the poofy part of the petticoat, there is like a slim skirt style. I like to have max amount of movement, so I would rather have it mimic the petticoat on the outside. And I also think this will give me maximum poof. So I'm going to cut these two pieces that are the top yoke and then I'm going to cut as many as I can or not cut more like rip as many as I can of the panel that is used for the gathered petticoat part of this to have on the inside my goal is to have two on the top level and four on the bottom to give me a full ability to walk and move around I do not like a tight skirt especially because I would like to be dancing and I'm going to need to climb steps and be helping with things at this wedding so I I absolutely need a dress I can move in. The best part about making your own petticoat is you get to make these decisions. And then for the tool, I am cutting 12 panels, four for the top row, eight for the bottom. So what I am doing with this is I have gotten my tool basically as thick as I can while still cutting it and managing all the layers. I think this is four layers of tool, essentially all on the fold. And I'm just cutting this like to be close enough. I don't feel the need to have this be precise since it's an undergarment and it will be something I will only ever wear as an undergarment. Spooky, as always, causes me plenty of trouble because she was trying to get her mouse that found itself under the tool. And yeah, so I am really trying to do this as efficiently as possible because I hate cutting things out. I especially hate cutting out tool. I am still technically not done with the dress itself yet. I will wait for the hem for the petticoat, but I still need to put in the boning. So I'm just measuring where those boning lines are to get the measurements that I need to cut my boning to. For the boning channels, this just instructs you to use actually sewn in boning, but I wanted to use steel boning because it just feels a lot better to me. It just has a lot more flexibility. And so what I'm doing here is these are basically like underwire channels and the steel bones go in them just fine. So I've cut those to the length that I need plus a little bit extra. And now I'm using my handy dandy bolt cutters to cut my steel spiral boning down to the size I need. Who knew when I bought these they would be so handy for sewing. So I have a really hard time putting on caps, so I ended up just giving up and using tape. If you have a cap tip, let me know. And then I'm just threading the bones into the channels. And then once the channels are done, I'm unpicking a little bit of stitches to be able to fold this in on itself. And then I am stitching the channels closed. I decided to just use purple thread for this because I didn't care about it matching or blending because these are on the inside of the dress. So you can hopefully fairly clearly see my stitches. There is no rhyme or reason. I'm just trying to make sure these channels are secure. And then once that's done, I am pinning in the boning to where I will hand sew it down. Spooky has decided to join me in my lap. So now what I am doing is I am following the stitching that they show in the pattern instructions, which is this kind of crisscross stitching where you go up one way and then you zigzag back down the other way at the end. I thought these also just kind of resulted in an aesthetically pleasing inside, so I was more than happy to do this. Now I'm returning my focus to the petticoat. The first thing that I'm doing is I am pinning all those layers of taffeta together. This is kind of my method where I like fold and go to make sure like nothing gets twisted when I'm adding panels of like three, four, five at once. So that way I can make sure everything's still lying flat. It's just kind of like a stacked sandwich method. I don't know. There's no, no official term for it as far as I know, but it is how I keep all my layers sorted. I am then repeating this process with tool. With a tool, it's even more important than ever. I keep my layers sorted as I am stitching eight of these together. And then I have those stitched together at the top. There is like a break where there's going to be a hole big enough for me to get into. So what I'm doing here is I am clipping that down. So that way I can double turn stitch this down like the instructions are telling me to do. Of course, I'll use my iron to really secure that. And then I will sew those down. Of course, all the other seams though, I am treating like normal. And now I am going to gather for the next 20 years of my life. First, starting with the taffeta. And then moving into the tool, it would have, of course, been 
easier if I didn't insist on my usual three lines of gathering, but it really looks so much nicer. And if I'm going to put in the work, I want to put in the work and actually end up with something I really like. And that looks really neat. And this is just the best way to do it. But I did feel like a tortured soul by the end of this. And I am on a break from gathers. And now that the gathering stitches are in, it is time to do the actual gathering. I decided to get the full skirt done before attaching it to the yoke, which I guess is what the instructions said. So I didn't decide it. I followed it. Here I am gathering the four bottom panels to the two top taffeta panels. This just takes time. And of course, I'm looking to keep the gathers even, which I have various pins and marks to do that. And I'm repeating that process with the tool and I really hate myself right now, but I got through it. It did take a long time, but we're doing it. For the inside of the taffeta, I'm going to be binding my seams. So here where the bottom and middle panels are, I am just sewing that rayon tape down before then folding it over and sewing it again. So that way I'm not getting all these weird trailing fuzzies everywhere, which is what you can see and is not ideal. So I am finishing these seams this way because I know if I do any other technique, it will not work. With that done, I am then focusing on the yoke, which I'm just pinning the front and backs together. The back seam will be openable so I can get my butt through it. And I am again finishing that seam with a double turned hem. I am also prepping this for its elastic channel, which is also basically like a giant double turned hem. Once this is done, I am first gathering the tool down where I will then base this on. So this is where me going off strict from the instructions required me to figure some things out because the instructions had you matching this to the like slim column that was originally inside. And I of course have made it these panels. So first what I'm going to do is I'm going to gather down the tool, sew it to the yoke. And then after that, I will gather the taffeta down. So the tool is a sandwich between the taffeta and the yoke and then when these all open up the tool will all be seam bound and seamless on the inside of this petticoat so the tool never has to touch my body but I still get amazing floof and with the petticoat pretty much done just needing a hem I can first start by hemming the dress I'm gonna hem the dress to the current length of the petticoat and then if I need to hem the petticoat I will I brought this over to my friend's house and they helped me pin this to be even it was very uneven due to stretch or cutting or whatever so once they had pinned it I am then just going around and I am marking an inch and a half away from where like the line they pinned it to and I am trimming that down so I don't have like this wild weird uneven hem down below once that is done I am doing a first turn on a hem this will give me a clean seam for when then I press up the hem I'm also running a gathering stitch here so I can ease in that hem I sadly broke my last gauge but now I am working with this gauge to get that inch and a half hem allowance that I want. I just think this looks nicer. I prefer a hand hem seam and I think a hand hem is best when there's a little bit more to it. I also hope this will get a little more body to the bottom of the dress. So what I've done is I've run that gathering stitch through. I'm just pulling it so it will ease into the curve of these ginormous panels. And then I am stitching around the whole circumference of the skirt. And let me tell you, this was a job, but I had some good TV on and I just stitched my heart away. And then with the hem done, I was able to see where the petticoat actually sit with a fully finished hem and it didn't need any trimming. So I'm just going to go around and give this a quick double turn hem. And last, what I'm doing here is I used some rayon seam binding to make little hanger things so I can hang this dress and I am sewing those in. And after that, I am stitching on the buttons. It took me a while to decide on a button, but I decided on these beautiful little glass iridescent buttons. I also got some plastic iridescent buttons because I was worried about the glass being too heavy, but the structure of the dress allowed for the heavier buttons, so I was pleased. But with that, we are all ready for the reveal.
right, you have seen the reveal. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed making this dress. The reveal was interesting to film because I chose a very wealthy part of town and I thought they would all be on their yachts during the fireworks on 4th of July, but a lot of them were home barbecuing. So I don't know if they make their own fireworks show or rich people don't like fireworks. I had quite a full audience and it was very awkward because I had planned it to have no audience. So, oh well, you can't have everything and I think the reveal still turned out beautiful despite how self-conscious I was feeling. With that, we're gonna go ahead and jump into our usual cost breakdown and then the official wrap up. So first, let me grab my spreadsheet. All right, we have our spreadsheet here. I actually have the petticoat and the holographic dress broken out into two cost breakdowns because the petticoat wasn't planned. The petticoat is what I'm gonna break down first. The fabric cost me $12.23. The notions will cost me $3.86. The pattern cost me $2. That brings me to supplies total of $18.09. So that's a pretty fantastic price for a petticoat to have only paid $18.09. Of course, once we start to factor in labor, we get a different story. This petticoat took me seven hours and 15 minutes, which is actually kind of wild. It was just all the gathering. It was just a lot of pieces to work with because I think it was a tier of eight and then a tier of four. So it just, it took a long time to get through all that. We are multiplying that by 32.70, which is a living wage here in Seattle to get $237.08 of labor costs, which would bring this petticoat to a total of $255.17. That is where we're at with the petticoat. For the holographic dress itself, of course, our supplies costs are gonna be much higher. This was a very specialty fabric. So the fabric for this was $127.63. The notions were $30.13. What really added into the price here was the boning and the buttons. The buttons were quite spendy, but I think they turned out great in our role worth it. And then the pattern was 3208, which is around what normally a Lady Marlowe pattern is. So that brought me to a supply total of $189.84. I still think this is a fantastic price. I am more than happy with it considering how couture this dress feels to me. No, I didn't do that much hand sewing, so it's not completely couture, but it is definitely a higher end wedding guest gown. The dress only took me 11 hours. Like if you think about it, it only took me I think two hours and 45 minutes longer than the petticoat. That's just because the lines were so clean and there was no gathering, all that saves a ton of time. And so we're gonna multiply that 11 hours by $32.70, which is the cost of a living wage in Seattle. Again, I just wanna emphasize that I think it's really important we are paying garment workers a living wage. And so if you are buying something for like $20, just think about what that means for the seamstress. A lot of seamstresses are only getting paid, like th I think the, one of the more recent reports out of the Shein factories was three pence an item. I would actually have to look at what that means in American dollars, but I know that is not very much money. And many of them are working in conditions where they have one day off for the whole month. That is not a living wage. That is not a livable situation. And I just wanna continue to advocate for garment workers by educating. Jesus, Spooky. We're going to continue along. Spooky just took a flying leap into my lap and dislodged my microphone. So hopefully nothing too chaotic happened to that earlier recording and hopefully nothing too chaotic is happening to this one now that she is laying firmly in my lap and on the microphone. But it is what it is. We sacrifice for our cats. But back to what I was talking about. I was just talking about living wages. I will link some sources down below for what I'm talking about. One of the goals of this channel is to educate people around what the cost of labor for garments should look like and just kind of make people think a little bit more about what they're spending on their clothes and if they are having basically like forced slave or unlivable wages being used to make their clothing. So that brings us to a total of labor for this dress to $359.70, which then brings the grand total for this dress to $549.54. That tracks for a dress this structured and this well made. I do think for that price you would ideally get something fully lined. I'll talk about it in a second, but I think that's one of my regrets on this piece. But overall, I think it's a good price for a dress like this. If you're your average consumer, that makes total sense to me. But let's talk about the dress itself. I'm gonna probably have to kick Spooky off my lap. But before we talk about the dress, I'll talk about the petticoat. I definitely think I cut the petticoat one size too big. I cut it at a medium. I think a small actually would have been better for me, but that's okay. It doesn't really change that much. I just put in a tighter elastic or I had to like pull a bunch of the elastic out. I think I ended up pulling out like eight inches. This works great under this dress and I'm really glad I made this. I think it adds so much to this dress because then this dress is not getting bogged down by the staticiness 
stickiness of it and clinging to my legs and all that stuff. So I'm really, really, really glad I made this because I think it makes a huge difference on how this dress ends up looking. I think this was well worth the like $18 I personally spent on it. I think I can use it for other looks and other things in my closet from here well into the future. So this will go somewhere in a bit in a closet because it is kind of a big piece. And then well, let's talk about this guy here. Oh, I didn't zip it up. As always, I'm going to real quick talk about the flaws. I want to first, before I dig into that, say I think this dress worked really, really well. I like to talk about the flaws because it's a way for me to better my sewing and also might be a way for you to better your sewing. These are all really, really nitpicky minor things. First minor thing, the buttons are just like a smidge bit crooked and uneven, but I just like couldn't bear to keep taking them on and off to get them to be correct. The lining does roll a little bit up and be visible. I think in retrospect, I would have understitched. I did not understitch this piece because they didn't specify it and I felt kind of confused by the lining and that is definitely a huge regret. We'll see if before the wedding I get impulsive and get myself access back to the lining to understitch it. I will see, but I do think it would make a huge difference and it's why I emphasize understitching. As far as fit, this bodice is just a smidge long. You will have seen in the reveal that it kind of like creases right under my bust. And then this fabric, I am probably before the wedding going to go in and do a proper seam binding or something because the edges of this fabric are so sharp and pokey and uncomfortable because they're plasticky. So like definitely when I was filming the reveal, I was being like stabbed by little tiny sparkly bits. So those are all the changes I would make. We're going to move on to everything I love about this dress. I think the silhouette is gorgeous. I wasn't sure at all about the little tabby tabs here, but once I put the buttons on, I really felt like it brought it together and I, my vision made sense. So that was exciting. I'm really glad I added the buttons. I almost didn't. And I do think that while this dress is beautiful, it would have been a little plain without the buttons. I know, purple holographic dress, plain. How dare you, Haley? But it would have felt plain for me. Do the skirt. Oh, it's just so pretty. I love this fabric so much. I am thinking I'm going to be in Denver next week, and I think I'm going to pick up some different colorways of this fabric to make some really intense blouses and maybe skirts with. We'll see. We'll see what my budget is and what I feel like doing. I do really like this fabric. It wasn't as terrible to work with as I expected. It ironed pretty well. It did not sew particularly well. I actually think that's why it's really pokey. It's hard to explain, but like the needle would sometimes catch these threads, these like iridescent threads that are woven into non iridescent threads. And then it would kind of like rip everything. I think I'm going to try using like a sharp needle next time I work with this fabric. I did try a few different needles and I didn't feel like anything worked, but I didn't have a sharp on hand. So that might have been the trick. The hem turned out really lovely, which I was excited about because I was a little bit nervous about the hem of this. But yeah, I think it's absolutely stunning and I'm really proud of it and I can't wait to wear it to my friend's wedding. They have seen it because they were the people helping me hem it. So they've seen the whole thing in all its glory. They're very excited about it too. And I'm just very very excited to go to my first queer wedding and watch my two best friends marry each other. So, and I'm excited to do it in this dress, although I will also say the wedding is in the middle of July and it's outside in Washington, so it will be hot. We will endure. By the time this video goes up, the wedding will be long over. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this video up. I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, you can support me over on Ko-Fi by buying me a coffee. It's just helpful. I put a lot of time and dedication into this channel and each video maybe makes $25 of ad revenue. I just like to kind of mention that because I talk about paying people wages. This is a hobby for me, so I'm not looking to get paid living wage off it by any standard. However, I do want to remind you that influencers a lot of times are not earning living wages by the time you calculate how many hours they put into content. So uh, just thoughts. And with that, I am actually going to sign off. You can like this or comment down below. I would love to hear if you have like a favorite wedding guest outfit that you've worn that you've just felt stunning in the way this dress makes me feel. If you haven't subscribed, I would love to have you stick around. I post every single Friday at 8 a.m. Pacific time and I will see you next week. Bye!